This is Dr. Adrian Holloway, audio log number 22. My search for a distraction from Origins Mysteries took an unforeseen turn that has left me deeply shaken, a stark deviation from the solace I sought within the walls of the town's lost epoch antique store. My affinity for antique shops traces back to childhood, an inherited fascination from my mother, a hoarder of time's relics. These excursions were more than mere shopping trips. They were expeditions into history, unearthing objects that whispered tales of their past lives. This passion, this reverence for the stories embedded in the ownerless artifacts, eventually guided me towards anthropology. Thus, it was with a heart heavy with recent revelations and a mind clouded by dread that I sought refuge in the familiar embrace of antiquity. Upon entering the lost epoch antique store, the chiming of the bell seemed to signal a descent into another realm, one markedly disconnected from the quaint charm of its exterior. The interior, vast beyond expectation, was a claustrophobic maze of pathways carved through mountains of furniture and knickknacks. The air was thick with a peculiar odor, a disturbing blend of rancid meat and an overly sweet perfume. As old-fashioned music played, a merciful reprieve from the haunting strains of Mercer's monolith, I stumbled upon a bargain bin filled with cassette cases of Mercer's and the harmonics music. The sight was a jarring reminder of the mysterious musician's pervasive influence, even in a place I had hoped would be a sanctuary from it. The oppressive atmosphere of the shop and the unsettling aura surrounding the items intensified a sense of unease I had only ever felt within the confines of the extension. It was a sensation of corruption, as if the very essence of the objects had been tainted by unseen forces. This disquietude rapidly spiraled into panic as the shop's labyrinthine layout ensnared me, transforming my attempt to escape into a disorienting ordeal. Amidst the growing terror, I glimpsed out of the corner of my eyes the stalking presence of two entities that I could only describe as resembling whippet dogs, though their movements were grotesquely human, crawling on hands and feet. In desperation I stumbled upon a half-open door, a potential exit from this nightmare. My relief was short-lived as the door slammed shut behind me, plunging me into the gloom of a narrow windowless room. As my presence triggered the bizarre and surreal appliances lining the shelves to buzz into life, a chilling realization dawned upon me. These objects, their designs oscillating between retro charm and unsettling futurism, were relics from the Thompson extension. In a desperate bid for escape, I lunged towards the door, only to find it unyielding as if held shut by an unseen force. Then, a noise, a mechanical whir punctuated by a soft click and sizzle of static, snatched my attention, compelling me to face the source. Among the activated devices, one in particular stood out, a television, its design a peculiar hybrid of past and future. The screen luminosity cut through the gloom with unnerving clarity. What it displayed was not a broadcast from some distant studio, but a point-of-view recording so vivid it bordered on the visceral. I was not merely a viewer. I was a vicarious participant, drawn into the scene with a realism that defied the screen's boundaries. The footage unfolded within the unmistakable setting of the Thompson extension. The 70s decor, the oppressive carpets, the claustrophobic ceiling tiles, and the ever-present flickering fluorescence all were painfully familiar. The realism was such that I could almost smell the musty, forgotten air of the extension, a scent that clawed at the back of my throat. The person through whose eyes I was forced to witness this scene looked down, revealing hands and arms swathed in bandages, dark with stains that spoke of wounds both fresh and festering. As they called out, Sarah, Betty, their voice was a cocktail of love laced with terror, a mother's call to her children marred by the dread of what she might find. 
The children in question, standing in the threshold of the playroom, turned to face the one who had addressed them. The horror that greeted me was beyond comprehension. Their faces were not those of children, but of Douglas Thompson. The grotesque incongruity of his adult features on their small forms was an abomination, a visual affront that seared itself into my mind. Their smiles were a perversion of joy, a cruel mockery that relished the woman, no, the mother's dawning horror. Her scream, a soul-rending cry of despair and anguish, resonated with a depth of emotion that transcended the medium through which it was conveyed. It was a sound that embodied pure terror, loss, and the irrevocable shattering of a mother's heart. The impact of that scream, laden with such raw despair, was the final blow in a series of assaults on my senses and psyche. Overwhelmed, my consciousness retreated into the merciful oblivion of a faint, a desperate escape from the unbearable reality unfolding before me.